Hello everybody and welcome, welcome to those who are watching on Facebook and welcome to those who are here with us. If you want to join us in the room, um, there is about to be the link posted under the video. Um, now, today's topic is professional development and music careers. So, I'll get the correct mouse and share my screen. Here we go. And what's even more exciting is, wow, that's not what I expected it to look like. Oh well, it looks like that now because I have no idea what I'm doing. Um, I got a new color background, but something else weird happened too. So, um, first thing we'll talk about is let's think about what things uh, somebody who studied music, maybe you've gone through the ABRSM exams and you've got to grade eight or even done a dip ABRSM. So what, what options are there and how do you get there? So the first one is that of being a solo performer. Now I have a guest solo performer today um, who um, I am, this is Hannah and I let Hannah introduce herself and I just, I just want to ask Hannah, um, how is it that, what did you have to do to become a solo performer? So if I spotlight you, can I spotlight you? Oh, where does it say, sp I'm sorry, Hannah. I can't, oh, I can't spotlight you because you don't have your video on, but now you do. So now it says I can spotlight you. So Hannah, I will also stop my share. Can go for your life? Can you unmute? Can you hear me? Okay. Good. Um, I was going to talk about doing orchestral performing as well. As that, that's actually mostly what I do, so I can talk about that as well. Um, so uh, Sarah's asked me to talk about where I got to and how I got here. So I um, studied at the Guildhall School of Music and Drama in the UK. Um, and before that I'd done, played, I played the oboe. I'd been playing the oboe since I was about 10. And I'd done lots of youth orchestras and things like that. And then I went to do my undergraduate degree at Guildhall studying oboe. And whilst um, studying there, I started doing um, concerts externally and a lot of being at Guildhall was making contacts and the people you get to know as well as doing masterclasses and things like that in different places. I just took as much external work as I could and the more you do, the more you get asked for other things and you make contacts. Um, so then once I graduated, um, I had quite a good amount of freelance work and whilst at Guildhall I did um, a second study in historical performance. Um, so, and then I did a fellowship year in that, um, which I don't know if that works the same in other countries. You can do sort of a springboard year where you are studying a bit and working a bit at the same time. And um, yeah, I found that most of my work, um, other rather than like doing auditions for things, most of it has been from getting to know people who've asked you to do other things. So it's worth being nice to everyone who you, who you meet because you never know who's going to ask you for things. Um, let me see what else I was going to say. I haven't had a chance to properly plan something to say, so I'm just saying off the top of my head. Um, I watch out for extras auditions coming up, so a lot of orchestras do um, auditions for their extras lists. Um, so I've been doing those for the Baroque orchestras um, around the UK. And I've uh, got some of my own chamber music groups, so it's good to make your own opportunities to organise um, solo and chamber music concerts. Um, I do a lot of sort of contacting music festivals um, and asking uh, to perform there and that sort of thing. Um, and after graduating, Sarah asked about professional development. Um, I sort of do, after graduating, I did a lot of playing for masterclasses and things like that. <laughs> And as well as that, I do various teaching as well, but I think someone else is going to talk about that. <laughs> Thank you so much, Hannah. And I'll, I'll spotlight myself again if I can find myself. Oops. What do they do? There, spotlight me. Oh, did you spotlight me? Thanks. Okay. Um, so thank you, Hannah. That was, you've basically now covered my whole presentation in, in two foul swoops. Um, so here we go. Um, so solo performer, um, had said most of this. I'm um, doing, she did a performance degree. Um, I didn't hear her say competitions. That's um, 
I know I I, brought, I wrote that there because I noticed the lady who spoke, Josephine Co, mentioned how beneficial competitions were for networking and also for getting experience performing on stage and also getting a feel of whether that's what you wanted to do. And then um, Hannah's already covered orchestral um, playing. Now, teaching. So um, I could I'll, I'll ask a fair few people here to share on this. So I, I just getting a music degree. Um, whether it's a music education degree or a music performance degree, um, I personally recommend a music performance degree and then doing education courses on top of that. Um, so, but there's this a lot of flexibility there. Now, co composition um, for those who um, one career op op opportunity is, is becoming a composer. So, I asked our favourite Christopher Norton if he would tell me what he how he got into composition and, and what his th um thresholds that he passed were so he said he did an undergraduate degree at the the a university of otago in dunedin and then he was largely self-taught but he got good advice um particularly from a, a composer named jack spears and from other individual performers he says he did a jazz course that was run by colin hemmingson who is a bassoonist who studied jazz at berkeley and he said he then joined a band and he just kept writing across a variety of genres and said he always found it enjoyable. So then I got an, I asked somebody else as well. I asked Dr. Paul Smith. Now, Dr. Paul Smith is a lecturer at University of New England. And he, um, the reason I asked him was because it's very different to Christopher Norton. Um, Paul Smith composes in more modern, the modern, what we might call modern classical. Um, so, and in particular, he composes with toy pianos. So if you search Dr. Paul Smith and toy pianos, then there's some really interesting videos on YouTube. And he says this, he did a general music degree and then it wasn't until the end of that degree that he started to think, oh, maybe I, I'm a composer. Um, and, and then he applied for honours in composition. So honours is what comes after a bachelor degree. And then, then he became more, fo that made him more focused. And then he went on to do his PhD with composition. So he says there's, we're getting, there's more and more work available for composers. And a friend um, said that a friend of his has spoken to him recently about content driven composing, um, mu like music for podcasts, social media, web series, and other uh, medias. Um, he said these are emerging composition fields with their own requirements, in addition to some of the more co what canon jobs like film film and art music composition. So, art music that's the term for the, 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 that modern music. Um, and he says that competitions can be very helpful in the world of art music because composers who are looking to get into this area can be adventurous, daring and more experimental so they can stand out what, in what would be likely hundreds of pieces. And, and you can see by using toy pianos that makes his music stand out because it's not something that's really been done. And I've lost the place on the thing. And then he says, it's like when you, when you enter a competition, he says it's like auditioning as an actor and you send your compositions out and you hope one of them will stick. So it's a bit of a hard slog. Um, he says, I try to have one of everything ready on the go, a piano solo, a string quartet, a mixed ensemble or woodwind solo. Then when I have time to look at what's available, I can make edits and then send my compositions out. Um, make sure the score looks interesting. So if they look at the score, the actual score has some visual interest. Um, page one with details and something a little bit different to catch their eyes straight away. And it says, I carved a niche, oh, he's, what I've just mentioned, he says, I carved a niche with toy pianos and operas and have built strong relationships with performer colleagues and collaborators. A performer from Italy, Antonietta Lofredi, Fredo, came to my university while I was doing PhD and I wrote her a piano work. She liked it and asked me to write for her a piece for toy piano and I've done many projects with her since and he went to the the toy piano festival which Antonietta hosted over there so he suggests that people who are interested in getting to composition start by writing pieces for their friends who play instruments just short pieces that they can begin working on and then they can begin working with others on music so that's um, Dr Paul Smith's 
thoughts about how, how the, the the process of becoming a composer. So another opportunity, which I know very little about, but is an arts administrator, and I know that many people who do. Um, music degrees and then do some managerial qualification they end up as arts managers in, in um, music places and then look up piano tuning now there is a certificate three in piano technology so for people who want to get into a, that field um, you, it's it's sort of like more of an apprenticeship qualification that's the Australia what you would do in Australia um, I can't speak for overseas but at least it'll give you an idea where to start looking and then audio engineer you know there's people who play with Ableton and Pro Tools and and mix different layers all together to make you know really cool music for people who like cool music and and so I couldn't think of anybody to ask to come and to share about that process but there are bachelor's degrees for music specifically in audio engineering okay which keyboard this one should turn no which one's going to turn the page that one no try again then we went too far. Oh dear. Oh, it was the right page. Here we go. I know what I'm doing. Okay. Now, there's the other option, and Hannah touched on this. I thought she must have cheated and looked at my notes first, I reckon. This is a portfolio musician where you do a little bit of everything. So, this is, and you know, we have a famous one, Bach. This was all of Bach, not all of Bach's jobs. This is some of Bach's jobs. He was an organ examiner. He was a performer. He sold his compositions. He did instrument maintenance, like piano tuning, except there was no pianos, um, but harpsichord tuning and repairs and organ tuning and repairs. He played for weddings and funerals. He gave private music lessons. He published and sold his own works. And there's much more. So there's, if anyone wants to look into much more, there's that. There, there, I saw, but I couldn't find it, a list of basically like his tax return, <laughs> not tax return, but like taxes. So all his incomes written down, categorized, and it, but I couldn't find the original document. So sorry to be so much more boring. So stepping away from these are the career options, let's focus, let's focus on teaching. So if we if we look at the career of music teaching why do professional development well professional development keeps giving us new ideas if we have a toolbox of teaching ideas every time we go to something we add something to that toolbox doesn't mean we necessarily use everything that's in that toolbox but we can add to it because you never know when it might be handy down the the track when we go to professional development it, it re-energizes us Part of that is just the community of going to professional development with, with people and that networking and being nice to everyone, as Hannah said, uh, which is very, very true. And I should have put that in my slides. Um, but when we re-energize it, it keeps us from going to stale. I remember as a young teacher sitting around and seeing these old teachers who really hadn't done any teacher training. And it, we're really almost past the enjoyment of teaching. Um, so that's, that's something we don't want. If we've passed the enjoyment, or if we've passed the stage of enjoying what we're doing, then that's going to reflect on onto our students as well. So, um, and then, you know, specialized courses can add to our teaching ability or knowledge of a particular area. And we have a guest person who's going to mention a bit, a few slides later about that. Um, and also professional development keeps us abreast of current research. When I first learned piano, everyone taught starting on middle C with two thumbs like this. And then as medical research got involved, we started to realize that this creates an null deviation. So if I wasn't abreast of that research, I might still be teaching that when actually it's not as good for the body as teaching in alignment. So professional film gives us that opportunity to be, to be aware what's going on in the world. Maybe we will disagree with, with, with what's being said, but at least we can be aware of it and considering it and challenging our own thoughts. Um, professional development increases memory retention. We, we know that if you repeat something 10,000 times, it's, it's better in your memory. And you go to a professional development and they say such and such. And our guest speaker later, she said something the last time she ran one of our Monday Zooms. They went, oh my goodness, I used to do that. I'd forgotten that I used to do that. That's brilliant, I'm bringing that back into my teaching. So, and just generally in professional development improves your teaching. Um, 
and I think I keep saying the same thing, exposes you to new ISBDs, but it also ex can expose you to new repertoire. So as a young teacher, I always went, whenever the publishers would have one of those, oh, let's show off our new publishers, uh, whatever we've just published. And I'd go because, yes, I know that they're trying to sell their, their, their stuff as well. But part of it is that, oh, wow, that's a piece that such and such of my student would really like, or that's a piece I'd love to add to my teaching. And there's an idea, and they often, they couch, the presentation of their materials with pedagogy. So, and they're, they're often free. I think they're usually free. So that's an excellent way to get some um, extra, extra professional development without actually um, spending money now. So what if I disagree? So if I'm in professional development and the person up the front says something I completely disagree with, I write it down. Because sometimes, many, many, many years later, I'll be teaching a student and all the stuff that I'm using is not working. And I'll, I might even say to the student, I disagree with this idea, but I want you to try it because I think it might work. Or let's try it and see if it works. And sometimes I've been surprised. Or sometimes my fear that the things that might go wrong went wrong, but also they got the benefit out of it as well. So, okay, now you've got the benefit out of it. Now here's the thing that might go wrong that we've got to correct. For instance, it might be a position of a hand and I said, oh, this other teacher used this image and I didn't like this image, but let's try it. And they try it and something goes wrong here, but they fix the elbow, for instance. So that sort of thing, you just don't know. And maybe you disagree now. And then 20 years later, it aligns with your philosophy. So when I first started teaching, you know, we were told, oh, listening to recordings is wrong. It destroys musicality. 10 years later, but I still wrote it down. And 10 years later, I started to try it and go, wait a second, this is really working quite well. Um, so, you know, having it written down means if you do, do, do change your philosophy or maybe you can find a way to tweak it to match your philosophy later. So it's, it's never worth rejecting an idea. You never know when it might come in handy, at least not completely rejecting it. Okay, so since, since, I admin the group admin ABRSM exams, which is where this is being live streamed. Um, so let's look at what ABRSM offers as far as professional development. So ABRSM offers performing diplomas, DIP ABRSM, LRSM and FRSM. I highly recommend these. Um, a couple of reasons. Even if you've got a performing degree, having sat these exams means you know what to expect and you know, so I, th I think that's very, very, very good. They say, they say that FRSM is equivalent to a master's level performance. Um, and DIP is something like first or second year and LRSM is somewhere in the middle. So I highly recommend them. And then there's the teaching diplomas. So the DIP teach, ABRSM, L teach, and I, I can't remember what the fellowship equivalent is called. Now these are excellent if you want an exam that forces you to do self-directed research. There's sample questions, there's, there's even sample resources, uh, recommended resources, that a good starting point. And it's really, really good. It's a way to re refresh. If you've been teaching a long time, you're like, well, I don't want to pay money to do a course, but I'd love to do some research and I'd like to direct myself, then this is a really good, really good option. Um, it's great if you want a refresher. It's great also for those starting out. So you're starting out and you want to get teaching, but you need to, you want some help getting into the headspace. The, the way the question, the questions, the topics that they're given in the syllabus are really good to research and, and, and just prepare you for teaching. And the first diploma is to give an idea. The DIP, ABA, the DIP teach covers beginner to grade six. Um, so, you know, it's, it, it gives you a good solid understanding of that, that range. Now they also they also have this future lawn sorry future learn course. This one is free, so actually no one in this room has any excuse not to go and do it. It's called becoming a better teacher. So um, that's that that one. I highly recommend you have a look at. I didn't actually get time to open it and see what was in it, but the fact it's free is always good. What could go possibly go wrong? And then only in the UK. So in the UK, ABRSM offers this qualification called the Certificate for Music Education. Um, it gets good reviews online. Everybody who I've come across who's done it spoke very highly of it. Um, it is equivalent to a Certificate 4 um, in the Australian Certificate 4. I'm not quite sure what that means in 
in in the UK though. Um, and the, this is the web address where that course is run. So if anyone in the UK is interested in doing that course, it's run through Enact Music. Going to university. So going to university. Oh, I'm told, thank you, I'm told that in the UK, a certificate four is called a level four qualification. So the next thing for, I want to progress, I want to continue in music as a career. What about university studies? Well, firstly, it's not, for teaching itself, it's not 100% necessary, but I would say it's 100% beneficial. I taught for many years without a degree, and then I had all my my ABRSM dips and I had all my AMUB dips and, and I had another qualification which I'll mention down the track. But starting university, or now I'm near the end of my masters, but it was such an excellent opportunity for a lot of reasons. Um, one, it's an excellent chance to develop your skills. There are things that you will cover in an ABRSM, AMUB, Trinity curriculum that, that, are, that are sort of in one direction. When you go to university, depending on the course, I guess, but generally it's a much broader, they cover a lot more things. So when I, as, as a student at university, I had to learn about doors, like Pro Tools and Ableton. I had to learn about composition, had to do musicology, had to do research analysis. These are things that are absolutely beneficial. And, and I didn't get a chance to do that through the other, the other courses I had done. So I think it's, it's very, very helpful. Um, you will also, if you, do a, sorry, if you do a musical education degree, they discuss education theories. Now, education theories are excellent. We can teach, usually if we start teaching, we'll teach the way our teacher taught us. But when we start studying educational theories, that can give us more insight into how and why the student is responding to particular activities in a particular way. Um, also, going to university gives you rigorous performance training in your instrument. And one thing that can happen is if we've just gone through, we've done our LSM, but we only ever did two hours practice a day. How do we know whether our technique is not going to cause an injury? We actually haven't tested it for enough. When you go to university, there is a higher expectation of performance and more practice needed. Because of that, if your technique is wrong, it will, you will discover it before you pass it on to other students. So um, it's, it's very good and you get chances for master classes and things like that. So you get more and more feedback on your playing and not just one, the one teacher that you had all the way through. Um, also, you can get, develop your harmony and oral skills beyond grade eight theory. And to, for the teaching dip teach, you need grade six theory. Um, for the L teacher, you need grade eight theory. When you go to university, that grade eight theory, by third year, you're starting to Ex go past that great grade eight theory and also stretch horizontally a bit. And as Hannah mentioned, social networking. University is a great chance to get to meet people. Now I wanted, I, I decided not, I was going to post a link and show the most amazing thing that happened to me in my undergrad was I met this lady named Nika Zaharia. And um, she was, she said to me, oh, I've got this deadline. I've got to get this album finished. I'm having trouble writing the piano part. She doesn't play piano. I went, oh, well, I'll do it. So I composed it and recorded it and sent it to her and then did a flute and viola part as well and sent it to her. And after I'd done that and she released her album, I learned that she actually had top 40 hits in Romania. So this song is in Romanian. I don't even know what the words mean. I can't even pronounce the name. But I'd never done anything like that. And to have that opportunity because of a social network and then she was interviewed on the radio and she mentioned that I had done the, the instrumental lines and the song was played on the radio. It just blows me away. So, and none of that would have happened had I stayed in my own little corner here. So it is a really great opportunity for networking because, you know, if I was looking for someone to play saxophone for me, I think, oh, I, went, I um, did some performances with this friend of mine at uni and so she'd be the first person I called. So definitely, as Hannah says, always be nice to everyone because you never know when you might want to network with them. Then, then, then there are specialist training opportunities. So we had um, Paul Wyatt a couple of weeks ago talk about the course Whole Body Learning, which um, uses a, a mix a mixture of um, code I and ORF. And, and the, the course that he runs specifically goes through the ABRSM repertoire and shows 
practical ways to apply um, education theories to the teaching of each of those works. And Finger Smart with Alice Yap runs something very similar. Um, I say very similar. She also goes through the ABRSM repertoire. Um, and then there's the Suzuki teacher training. So that's the, when I said specialist training opportunities, that's the one that I did. That was, as a, a young teacher, I was looking for something more. And at that moment, unless I went to university, the only way, place I could get that sort of teacher training in Sydney was the Suzuki, um, Suzuki um, Talent Education Association. And to, the, to do that training, you need to do an audition. And then that training works, you, you study the teaching of all the works in the Suzuki repertoire. And you, it's sort of like an apprenticeship. You work alongside a teacher, you watch that teacher, um, and you have a lot of essays to write. So at the time I did it, the, um, I guess the certificate, there was a certificate four, which is level four, and then there was one beyond that, um, which we called diploma. So there was three levels, certificate three, certificate four, and diploma. Um, and I, I don't think the British Suzuki Institute uses the same system, but that was what we used here. Um, and that covered, that included some university modules on child education and things like that. So I think that that particular specialist course absolutely shaped me as a teacher. Um, it, it didn't broaden my knowledge in the same way university did, but it focused in my knowledge on teaching and teaching methods. And the next one, this is where we have our amazing next guest speaker, um, is the Phoenix Collective. So I will let, I will let, and I will say the name right, Cyrilla. How I said it right, I will un I will spotlight you. I will let her share about that. Oh wait, I'll unspotlight myself. Sorry. Oh, Peter will do it. He's better than me. That's easy. Thanks. Okay, it's it's Cirilla. <laughs> it's okay. It's fine. Everybody gets it wrong. Sorry about the cat ears. I can't help it. I just felt in the mood today. <laughs> um. Yeah, just uh, just to say a little bit um, about myself, because actually that's relevant to what Sarah was saying earlier um, about, you know, the roots into teaching. Um, mine was slightly unusual, actually, because I grew up thinking I wasn't musical at all. Um, I did grade seven piano. I got to that through. I, I just about scraped through at the second attempt. Um, and I hated the piano. I, I never, ever play it uh, other than for my work. I never play it for pleasure. Um, so, you know, I, for me, going through the grade exams uh, was not a nice experience at all. Um, because, you know, I was just never terribly good at playing the piano. And, you know, and I was always told, well, your oral's not very good, so we'll make sure your scales are extra good. Um, which actually doesn't solve the problem. It's a bit like saying to a child, well, your reading isn't very good, so we'll make sure your maths is extra good instead. Um, it doesn't help. And because I'm very old, I did do O-level music and I couldn't do, you know, Bach, chorale, harmony went whoosh. And I remember thinking, well, why can't you have consecutive fifths and octaves? Nobody could actually tell me. Um, and I scraped through that because I could write essays. So I wrote good essays about Dido and Aeneas. Um, and that was it. Um, my other sort of musical influences, I, I had parents who were very keen amateur musicians. So, and they always had classical music on at home. So of course I rebelled big time. Um, and that was, you know, so not for me. <laughs> so, um, I went to teach training college and trained as a class teacher of five to nine year olds. And I'd been, oh, I used to have to play the piano in assembly. It was just the most ghastly thing. Um, and I remember one of the, yeah, you know, one of my usual, uh, let's play the introduction to the hymn and land beautifully on the wrong chord. And I remember one of the teachers going past me at the end of assembly and she said, we all feel so sorry for you. <laughs> so, <laughs> and it still brings me out in hives, you know, just sort of thinking about it. But I've been teaching for a couple of years and my head teacher asked me to be in charge of music because I 
<laughs> because I could land on the wrong chord. Um, so I then found that she gave me the children in the school to teach, and that was um, up to year three, so up to eight eight year olds. And I hadn't got a clue what to do with them. Um, we did very little music at college. Um, I do remember one lecture where they wrote on the board, off equals rhythm, kodai equals pitch. I remember thinking, what's that all about? I haven't got a clue. Um, so I struggled on for, for, you know, for six months or so, making odd things up and thinking, what, what is actually singing a song? What is that actually teaching the children? There must be something more you can do with a song other than just sing it. What, what does that actually do? Anyway, my head teacher, who was very keen on music, she used to teach music herself. One day she said, there's a Kodai course on locally. She said, I've done some. I think you'd love it. Why don't you go? So I did. And the very first time that we sang so me, <laughs> something in my head and my ears woke up that had never been woken up before. And I just went, ah, ah, ah. <laughs> it's sort of like, and um, how can something so simple have such a big effect? But it did. And um, they said at the end of this introductory session that, uh, there was somebody called Cecilia Voider was going to come and do six Monday afternoon sessions. Now, Cecilia was actually the person that Kodai sent to the UK, um, apparently in 1967, just before Kodai died. Uh, Yehudi Menuhin asked him to send someone to teach at his school in the UK. And that was Cecilia, and she was my first teacher. And I remember these, these six Monday afternoons just being completely blown away with, and I just went, how can you teach music any other way? <laughs> but, and I don't have to play the piano to do it. How lovely, I can just sing. So, uh, so I, I was a class teacher for 11 years. And I just did my Kodai training very, very gradually because there wasn't very much around um, at that time. So sometimes all I would do in a year would be a, a week's summer school. And that, that was it. And I would sort of feed off that for the rest of the year. So I learned very gradually and very slowly. And that actually has helped me. And I, I do think that you often are a better teacher of something that you have not found easy yourself. Because if you find something easy, you just go, why can't somebody else do it? <laughs> it's, it's so simple. Oh, I can do it. Why can't you? Whereas if you have learned like I did, I, I always consider that my 11 years of piano lessons taught me something about playing the piano and taught me almost nothing about music. And I feel in my inner self that I didn't start to learn music until I started learning Kodai. And that was when, for myself, I'm not just talking about the teaching, I'm talking about my own musicianship. So many things that I either hadn't understood or I'd semi-understood or were a big mystery to me, suddenly I could do them and I could understand them. And hurrah, at last, it wasn't um, that only clever people could sight sing. I could do it. It's still one of my most exciting things is to be able to pick up pretty much any piece of music and sight sing it. And that to me was such a huge mystery. Or you can only do that if you've got perfect pitch. You can only do that if you've got a really good ear. You can only do that if, no. And, and I, I realized as an educator of any subject, you would never say to a child, oh, sorry, you can't learn to read because you're not talented at it. You know, it's ridiculous. It's laughable. You know, yeah, and if a child has difficulty learning to read, what do we do? We find different strategies. We try different things. So why is music? Music should not be seen as any different. Um, and Kodai's sort of overarching um, philosophy was music should belong to everyone. It is a basic human right. It is not something 
only for the rich or for the talented or for the, you know, it is something for everyone. And that, you know, that was one of his motivations was that he wanted to develop a musically literate country so that people would go to concerts and they would understand the music that they were listening to. So, um, so I just got completely, <laughs> completely hooked. I fell into a job teaching at the Guildhall um, in London uh, when I was very inexperienced and that was a huge learning curve for me. Um, and I was still class teaching at that time. And that was actually when I stopped the class teaching because I realized I couldn't do five days full time plus a day on, on Saturday, I was completely dead. So I did, I took the plunge and went part time because I'd always known that class teaching wasn't quite right for me. There were bits of it I loved and bits of it I hated. And I knew it wasn't quite, quite the right fit, uh, but I didn't know what was. So, as I said, and even when I started learning Kodai, it wasn't immediately apparent that this is what I should be doing. It, it was a very, very gradual process. Um, and I did my um, intermediate um, exam in Kodai musicianship. And then I did my, um, I, I did, I think I got a merit for that, but I had lots of other things going on in my life, uh, like an ex-armed robber which I won't go into because I was very young and you know so my what I'm trying to say is I wasn't totally focused on my on my music learning <laughs> but when I did the advanced course I was and I worked my socks off I can tell you <laughs> and I had to do my advanced diploma in front of these two very very scary ancient Hungarians um, and I think there were nine of us in the class that year. And at the end, they called me in and they said, we think you're the best. Will you start to teach the adults in the beginners in September? And I went, ah, teach adults? I've only taught up to eight year olds. Um, <laughs> so, that, so that was another sort of huge, huge learning curve. Um, and gradually, you know, I've just had lots and lots of experience, in lots of different primary schools. Uh, I was the first advisory teacher for the Voices Foundation. Uh, so that involved going to train lots of um, school staff, so non-musician class teachers. So I've done a lot of that and, and a lot of um, training musicians as well. And it's, it's never ceased to amaze. Well, it used to amaze me because I used to be so in awe of people who had music degrees or diplomas or whatever, because I didn't. And, but until I discovered that I could do things that they couldn't, um, you know, I have found people with, with grade eight who can't tell if do, 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 do is going up or down. I had a lady who had no clue. Uh, whether she said I, I can't hear is that going down did it go up first I don't I yeah and you know and I remember thinking hmm? <laughs> um, and I did teach an, uh, a top orchestral musician who I asked him to sing something with letter names after he'd sung it with sulfur and his face went and I went letter names in the key of D start on A is so and he went I can't do letter names I said, don't be silly. You're just on your way back from Glyndebourne. Of course you can do letter names. And he said, no, as a child, he'd found letter names really hard. So he had learned to play by it reading interval and finger pattern. So, you know, so I, I've never stopped sort of being amazed that I think everybody has these, these gaps. And I always feel that Kodai is very much musical polyfiller because it does, you know, it does come along and it does help you fill those gaps. So uh, that's, that's basically uh, sort of it. I stopped teaching in schools a few years ago. I've just stopped at Guildhall after 34 years, <laughs> which was a bit of a, bit of a shock. And I, I am missing teaching the, um, the children, I must say. It's, but I'm doing lots of teaching adults at the moment and that's where Phoenix comes into it. Um, I left the British Kodai Academy about three years ago um, 
not a not a pleasant story. Um, and I just thought I've, I've still got to be doing something. So the Phoenix had to arise. And that's the Phoenix Collective. Uh, it, it is just a group of us who are all Kodai trained, uh, who are all passionate about music education. And we're passionate about education in general, actually. And we offer all these lovely online courses. Um, we've just done a pretty much finished our first year. And it's all been very exciting. And some of the people here are, have actually been students on it. So, <laughs> so oh, thank you. Thank you, Claire. <laughs> right on cue. <laughs> so, so if anybody wants to, you know, know anything, I can put it in the chat. I can put the, um, or I can, if, if Sarah can let me share screen, I can put up something that's just got the website and the. Um, I actually had the website on the, on the, Right. Our website, I'm afraid, is very out of date and we're we, something we're just in the middle of doing is starting a different one. And uh, uh, we've got all the information about next year's courses will be going up in the next week or two. So there's nothing the, at the moment, if you go to our website, um, there's just sort of general information and some out of date information, but you can contact us through the, the contact form. Um, so if you've got any questions at all, but we're, we're basically running um, courses for class teachers, primary teachers and instrumental teachers at the moment. Um, we have three members of the Halle Orchestra, um, which is big. Uh, UK orchestra um, as our students. We, we've got all sorts of people. We've got people from the Solomon Islands and from Jordan. We've got a lovely uh, student who's just set up a music academy using Kodai principles in Jordan. It's the first time Kodai has been used there. So that's all pretty exciting. Um, one of our students um, in Spain he actually teaches English through music. So he uses my, oh, here's one I prepared earlier, uh, my Jolly Music books, uh, which all of them have 30, 30 lesson plans. It's all sort of very detailed. Uh, you can start, start it, it. It was written for classes, but if you're an instrumental teacher, you can easily adapt, adapt things. Uh, I know several people who've done that. And Jolly Music, if you start it with sort of five, six, seven year olds, and then you build it up, there's five books altogether, more or less takes you up to sort of 10 year olds ish. And I'm going, I want to write some more <laughs> in my spare time. I'll shut up now, Sarah. That was, that was Cyrilla's two minutes. Um... <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I will shut up. No, it's I can't fine. Help it. um, that, you know, you 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 tangentialized amazingly, and now I'm going to forget all the tangent tangents that you took. That I was thinking, oh, yeah, we should we should come back to that. Uh, one thing you said about being a filler and how people can get to grade eight and not have skills, and I think that's really important, and that's one of the reasons why I started running these these sessions in the first place. That when teaching and not teaching skills we don't teach to pass the exams we teach to teach skills and mm. and so by constantly learning new things and new ways of new ways of teaching and new ideas for teaching i should say more 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 specifically we can we can make sure that we're creating whole musicians not part musicians and yes. and um something dr suzuki said and he my suzuki training comes in that when we learn language there's no dropouts unless there's a, a disability then every child learns to speak so he asks the question well why does every child learn to speak and then when they go to school suddenly there's some that drop out and 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 whatever and says well there must be something wrong with the education system because the education uh, system that teaches language works so um mm -hmm. yet your your comment made me think of that and the during all the courses I've done, we've touched on Kodai. I've researched a little bit of Kodai, but only touched on it. So after my thesis, my plan is actually to do the Kodai course as a way of extending my own knowledge and learning more about that aspect of it, where I have a bit of knowledge and I'd like to mm. 
be challenged a bit more and in, in that area. So that's my my to do list. Um, and <laughs> yes, <laughs> so, I've got one of those as well. Uh, yeah. Sorry, I just mean to say uh, we also like, let do... me spotlight you because I've I've I didn't want. It was to just share a very quick one spaces, extra. Oh, thanks. Uh, yeah. Is that uh, besides our sort of courses for teachers? we do offer musicianship classes. Musicianship is part of all the weekend courses anyway, but we do also offer specific musicianship. I mean, I've, I've got three groups um, at the moment, um, which includes some overseas. I've got a lady in Brunei, I've got someone in uh, Malaysia um, who, who are currently studying musicianship with with me and there are other uh, phoenix tutors as well offering musicianship at different levels and that's it's just my favorite thing to do <laughs> i shut up again <laughs> i think peter will spotlight me oh, if he's that. not distracted um now there was one more thing on the slide but i won't worry about bringing the slide up and that is um, response to abuse and neglect. So if you are doing professional development as a teacher, this is a really important one. And in many, at least in Australia, it's compulsory in one form or another. And similar to all the other professional development, it's a sort of course that is worth doing regularly um, to, to keep yourself aware of what are the warning signs. Um, as um, instrumental teachers, we have a, a, an amazing position that we will be with a student for five, 10 years. Something that a classroom teacher who also gets a great relationship with a student, but it lasts a year. And we get a long-term relationship. It often involves the whole family. And it means we do get insights that sometimes we see things that others don't. And, and often we are in the position that we can actually help things before anything escalates, not always, but the response to abuse and neglect, and I actually just thought I will try and, and see if we can run something along those lines for one of the Monday Zooms. Um, just because it's sort of like, well, it's nothing to do with music, but it, it's something to do with teaching. So if you if it is not compulsory to do this in your country, highly recommend, um, maybe I can ask Claire if you can put in the link um, uh, if you know, I'm assuming Claire would know because she knows everything, um, a, um, a, an equivalent to respond to ne abuse and neglect that would be in the UK. And I can ask um, someone if, um, I don't know, um, WKL, if there's something similar in Hong Kong, if you can add it to the, the, the live stream forum uh, that would be really helpful and then what country have I missed Singapore and Malaysia so I'll I'll try and track that down because that's that's probably a great starting point anyway um, if, if someone's thinking oh I want to start teaching really good place to start because <laughs> other than being compulsory it's very very important to have now um, that is actually the end of the official part of the presentation. So if anyone has a question or a comment they wanna make, um, if you show your video, you will be on the, the, the live stream. <laughs> so um, if you're welcome to say something without turning the video, you're welcome to add it to the chat. And Claire has added to the chat that it is called safeguarding training in the UK. Um, so um, that's our RAN here for those who are from South Australia. So. The, the, I guess I could stop live streaming and open the floor too. But is there any questions in the chat? No. no, okay, let me stop live streaming. Then we could be more relaxed. So to people watching the live stream, have a great day, night, morning.